In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Sky Chilton. He's the co-founder of Rocket Cases. They make protective iPhone cases. He talks about, in their first year of business, how they did six figures working part-time. He also talks about some of the challenges of working with manufacturers in China. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Sky Chilton. He's the co-founder of Rocket Cases. They make iPhone cases as cool as they are protective. You should check them out. They actually are really cool. Their cases are sold in Best Buy, Amazon, and Vancouver retail stores. Their first year of business, they did six figures working part-time, and they started with $1,500 between the three of them. Sky, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I'm excited to hear your big lessons. He made a huge sacrifice for one today because there's a Canadian Olympic hockey game, so I appreciate that too. But I'm excited to hear your big lessons and mistakes learned on your journey to success, what worked and what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about Sky is... um, is he takes a cold shower every morning and he actually blow dries his razor because it makes it last longer. (laughs) That was a good one. One of the best ones I've had. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty quirky. And Uh, I want to hear, you know, like if people go on your website, you you produce these beautiful rocking cases. And immediately when I I saw them on the site, I was like, I need to interview this guy, this company and reached out to you. Um, But I want to find out, kind of go back in time a little bit about what influenced you growing up? Um, Well, my dad was a really big part of that. He uh, ran his own business. Um, He was able to work right next door to his house, our house where we had his office. And um, anytime, you know, I needed him, I could walk out the door, walk over to his office. He would stop what he was doing and take the time to like, you know, give me what I needed. He'd go back to work and You know, I like, I look back on that now and see how beneficial it was. Whereas today you see two parents working, you see them commuting who knows how many hours each day back and forth. You have kids in childcare and you really don't have um, both parents able to be hands on a lot of the time. Um, And so I was really, really thankful for that. And, you know, I, it gave me um, a lot of opportunities to do things from him being an entrepreneur himself. So from that time, did you know I'm gonna do something on my own? Definitely not. Like, growing up, um, I was really focused on sports. Um, My dad pushed me into baseball because he was American. Um, And so I played baseball at university. Uh, You did, okay. What position? uh, Pitcher. You know, most most Canadians play hockey growing up. Um, but no, I never touched skates at all. And so, yeah, I thought I was like, I wanted to play at least university level was one of my goals. I did that. And kind of, once I got to that stage, I figured out that it would take me just that next level of dedication to get to, you know, the next level of performance. And I didn't see it in me. So I turned and focused on my studies, which were taking a hit from all the training you have to do when you're in university sports and uh, focused on computer science and mathematics. So how fast did you throw? Uh, probably a little over 80. Okay. Uh, most people compared me, if anybody knows baseball players, to uh, Jamie Moyer, who is yeah. probably... You kind of look sport. like him a little bit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably one of the slowest pitchers in, in Major League I'm baseball. in Chicago, and he played for the Cubs for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the oldest pitchers, too. Yeah. Nice. I like that. So. Yeah. You know, so then what, at what point did you think, well, I, I want to get into this entrepreneur stuff. I want to, you know, have my own business. Because you had that, that seed planted early on from what your dad did. Yeah. I never really thought about it going through school just because um, I was more based in computers. So I always thought I was going to, you know, work for a software company, work for a game company. My dad always wanted me to go work for Apple. Um, and then once I got into the workforce out of school, I ended up in healthcare for a while which uh, you know was good for a couple of years. It was a good paycheck, good benefits, but uh, really didn't stimulate me. 
And I ended up quitting that. I took a year off. I went and traveled uh, Argentina with my dad, fly fishing for five weeks, which was just an amazing trip. And uh, during that time, uh, I read Four Hour Work Week, and that really planted the seed and got me thinking about other stuff. Um, and after I came back, I then you know went back to work at a smaller startup, which was great. You know, I was maybe the number five hire, and then kind of went on from there and. You know, I want to back up years. a little bit for a second, Sky. And sure. I think it's really interesting. Tell people what your dad's business is. So my dad is a wholesaler of high quality mushroom extracts. Uh, everyone, you know, always thinks it's really quirky and weird whenever I mention it. And most people just think about magic mushrooms. Right. Um, but uh, they're actually used in a lot of different supplements and vitamins. So he imports them from China and then resells them to different uh, distribution and health food companies. So what did you learn from him early on in business from him in the high quality mushroom extract business? Uh, there's a lot of products and opportunity in China. Uh, there's so much going on over there. It's just it's crazy. Getting to actually go over there and see it was amazing. Um, and then just you got to put in the time, you know, seeing him out in the office, day in, day out, you know, putting in the hours, getting stuff done, going to expos, going overseas to visit suppliers, you know, all that makes a difference. Yeah. So tell me how Rocket Cases first got started and how you met your co-founders. So yeah, one of my co-founders, he was the one that recruited me for this small startup, um, which he took about six months for him to recruit me. I was kind of on... Uh, a mini sabbatical kind of leave where I didn't really want to do anything and he finally convinced me to come on board and so that was great so he was actually a kid who grew up just down the street from me um, but I never really ended up hanging out with him but once I came on board we started working together and it was really great um, my other co-founder Jim he came on board with us to do some marketing work and then we he was a friend of a friend as well and we just kind of started collaborating and we're like you know we all wanted to do something, so let's put our heads together. Was Jim working at the company too, or did he, was he doing something else? He was working at the company too. He got brought on for, I think, six to eight months um, just to do some sales and marketing work. Yeah. And I know that we, I want to hear more about kind of the early days and what you did. And I know we talked about your, your dad. Um, I wanted to mention also kind of the inspiration drive you got from your mom. Can you talk about yeah. that? Uh, yeah, my mom um, was a very, very spiritual person. She passed away when I was 18 from uh, liver cancer, um, which was, that. yeah, it was uh, very tough. But I, you know, I look back on that and I think about, um, you know, you remember the good times and you, it's kind of made me to be a lot more thankful because I wished that I had been more thankful and caring back then when she was around. Mm -hmm. And does that change anything from how you act in your business or how, what drives you or inspires you at this point? Like what lesson did you learn from her that you kind of carry on? I think just to be more down to earth, um, you know, to be more open, um, to be more genuine and uh, just to be a lot more caring. Yeah, I mean, you seem like a genuine, caring person, so as if <laughs> I could see that. But um, so the early days of the company, you guys came together. Um, what did you do first? So the first thing we did, we uh, we just ordered a bunch of random products that we thought were cool from some of these uh, discount China sites. Um, so we ordered like we ordered cell phone cases, we ordered camera accessories, um, just a lot of little like knickknacks. Like we have some magnets fridge magnets that look like gum um, really odd stuff that you know might be cool and so we ordered it waited you know six to eight weeks because the shipping is horrible from China and you know you finally get it in your hands it smells like plastic and has that kind of uh, off gassing to it um, and then we uh, ended up coming to like a few different cases that we really liked so were you at that point knew you wanted to do cases or were you just ordering a bunch of stuff to see you know, to get ideas? It was mainly for ideas. And then uh, we came on a couple of cases and we were like, yeah, these are really good. 
kind of uh, we wore them around. People really liked them. Are like, yeah, we could probably sell these things. So that's how you came up with the idea. Of the were there anything that was second contention that almost made the cut? Because now, obviously, you guys are really laser focused and just do cases. Yeah, we uh, the camera accessories was a big one. Um, there was a few other shops online at the time, um, so that was like it was just like you have little dust blowers and cleaners and things like that that uh, don't cost a lot and have decent markup. But uh, we were all iPhone users, so that was really easy. Um, all of us grew up on Macs, so it was just kind of really uh, related to what we liked. Yeah, no, I like how you tested it. You basically just put it on your cases and you got feedback from people who yeah. you probably say they like it and they may buy it. Um, so with that, where did you even find the stuff from China? How did you even find it? Um, so I'm trying to remember where I actually knew about some of these sites. But um, it was, yeah, early on, I think just searching for like discount case products or discount uh, whatever camera accessories, um, some of these sites turn up and uh, then, you know, you get your, your choice of the litter really, you know, they have just about anything you can think of. Whereas now like it's, uh, they're like similar to like Alibaba, but they're more consumer based as opposed to wholesale. Yeah. So, were you ever worried if you ordered it and then you would never you paid and never come, or was that? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that happens. Like that happens a lot. You know, you'll sometimes you'll wait. You know, eight plus weeks for it to arrive. Sometimes it doesn't show up, and then the support is horrible. So, how do you find and choose one that you trust? Um, yeah, there. At least when you start to do more bulk orders for those. It's, it's a little bit easier, um, but uh, early on when we first started, all we did was uh, drop ship for the first six months, I think. So we didn't even touch shipping. We just passed our orders to uh, these sites and they did all the work for us. But uh, in turn, you know, we um, inherited a lot of their faults. So they drop ship from China? Yeah. So would someone have to wait like six to eight weeks to get it? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Uh, so, did you ever get, um, you know, customer? I don't know. If, uh, tempers is the right word, but um, people oh, yeah. want to know what's going on. Yeah, definitely. We had complaints all the time. That was probably that was our biggest pain point early on was just shipping, and it's still like it's still a big pain point for a lot of people. Like, even if you tell them, you know, a certain day that it's gonna or interval it's gonna arrive in, you know, they still people still want it now. Yeah. And so there's a big challenge between like shipping costs and how long the customer is willing to wait and, you know, how much, you know, people love free shipping too. And so what's the balance there? Yeah. So you started off, you ordered a bulk of stuff, you liked the cases, and then what did you do to get traction, start getting customers? So we uh, thought we could market some of these cases a lot better than everyone else. And uh, John and I both have a web background. So we just built our own site really easily, custom shopping cart, tied it into PayPal. And uh, then I had been playing with AdWords a little bit then. Um, and so we just targeted iPhone users. And at the time, mobile clicks were still really cheap where we could get them for under 10 cents a click. And so we would get really low conversions. There wasn't a lot of competition there at the time and now it's, it's really saturated. Um, and so, yeah, that AdWords really got us off the ground and gave us traction and gave us that uh, validation that we knew that it was possible. We we're talking about rocket cases. I realize, you know, I can visualize it. Do you have some around that you can just kind of show? Um, um, yeah, I got a couple right here. Yeah. I mean, I'll link up your site and everything, but I think it will help. People can kind of visualize what they look like, some of the versions. Let me get my phone quick. Yeah. So for anyone uh, watching or listening, he's uh, this guy's grabbing some some of the actual cases so we can take a look at them. Yeah, so this is our uh, our Woody Hybrid case. Okay. Um, so it's actually it's got like a plastic shell to it, which gives it a lot more uh, durability, mm -hmm. and it's a, a dark walnut sheet. That's actually wood, though. That's, that's wood. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's dark walnut. Um, that's actually the only one I have right now because I just. Cleaned out my office. We just got uh, our first office. Congratulations. This, yeah. 
a big step and it's uh it's really I wasn't sure about it at first, but now I'm I'm really stoked on it. Yeah. I'll I'll link it up and show people cuz you have some cool like ones that look like a Nintendo controller, cassette tape, a VHS tape. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, we started off with uh this retro theme and now uh we're slowly billeting out our uh, elements line, which is more like woods, fabrics, metals, that sort of thing. So when you then you're um, drop shipping it from China. Um, mm -hmm. When did you decide to actually take it more in your control? Yeah, I was about six months in. Um, we started looking at fulfillment, and we knew that um, that was going to be the next step. Um, ordering more cost up front because we're going to have to order stock now, but um, it's going to give us the opportunity to do our own custom branding. So then we can order OEM and put whatever we want on these cases, get custom boxes done and really make a better experience for the customer, give them better shipping options, all that. Like there's just so many plus sides to it that, you know, it was naturally the next step. And when you take that next step, how hard was that? Because obviously now you have to buy more up front. Yeah, it was tough. Um, I think we might have injected more money at that time. Because uh, we did have to make an investment into stock and there was some upfront costs with the fulfillment center. Um, but yeah, it definitely paid off long term. So what I know one of the biggest things I mentioned in the first part of the of the intro is you got in the Best Buy. How did you do that? Yeah, that was a pretty random story. Um, we got just an email through our contact form. Um, and he was like, yeah, we're looking at, uh, you know, your Game Boy case and your controller case. Um, and, you know, we'd like to put it into our store. And this was like a guy from Best Buy. And we kind of read it and started freaking out, you know, <laughs> we're like, did Best Buy just contact us through our website? Like, we didn't reach out at all or do anything like that. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> just totally caught us off guard. And, you know, immediately we just started going back and forth. Um, and then we ended up putting a deal in place and yeah, it, like carried us through that first year of business. So what is that you now you're negotiating with Best Buy. How did that, how did that work? Um, we, had, they actually put us through their, uh, distributor. So we were negotiating with them, but it was, uh, it wasn't too bad. They definitely, they didn't grind us or anything like that. Like you hear with some of these like Walmart stories. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we got a good price. They got a good price. Um, I think all of us made money, so it was you know it was a great opportunity to see what getting into that retail channel is like, and then uh, you know knowing that it's possible for us to do that, you know, being as small as we were at the time, like six months into our business, and then getting contacted by Best Buy is crazy. And and I love the creative ideas on your on your cases. Is there any like intellectual property issues? because there's some, or do you keep them generic because there's certain brands, you know, like the Nintendo or something like that? How do you, how do you work around that? Yeah, we try and keep them generic. So we don't uh, include any trademark terms or anything along those lines. Um, so far it's been fine. Um, and yeah, we just, you know, kind of roll with it, but um, cause it takes a, a lot to go through and get some of those deals in place with you know if you want to put something in place with nintendo right uh, is it worth sure. it For worth sure. their time i mean because you do i saw on there the reason i bring it up is you have branded cases so mm -hmm. how how did you decide when did you first start you know deciding to do branded cases because i see that maybe taking you off of your main focus a little bit and how did you decide to to do that yeah that's uh that's been a growing channel for us is just doing custom branded cases for businesses. Um, you know, we started to get requests from our friends who are business owners and, you know, they wanted these branded products that they could give away at trade shows, that they could resell to their fan base or their customers, you know, different uh, swag options that's like a lot nicer than a pen or, you know, some little cheesy thing. Um, so now that, you know, people are on their phones everywhere now, you know, it's almost like the next billboard. Oh, for sure. So is, does that take a lot of time and energy on your part? Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's growing more now. We're getting a lot more leads, which has been great. So um, these are all more uh, bulk orders. Um, so usually it's always at least 100 units 
um, and then it kind of scales up from there. And uh, yeah, so we've done deals with uh, the local hockey team here, the Vancouver Giants, who are uh, the junior team. Um, we've done deals with Hootsuite, who are the big social media platform. Um, we did a tech school in the States. We did some cases for them, which they've got a tech program where all their uh, students get free iPhones, which is pretty awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So with that, um, you know, what the case is, do they, do people know it's rocket cases or does it, is it just completely branded for them and you don't have any, you know, rocket case logo or how do you decide to do one or the other? It's uh, it's completely branded for the client. So it's like completely their product. Um, we've uh, done a few with like plastic sleeves that just have like our logo on them. So the case comes in a little plastic sleeve. Um, but for the most part, it's like just all the client's product. Got it. Um, and so I know you mentioned that when I talked about traction, Best Buy, and also high-profile bloggers really helped. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, my partner, John, he uh, touched base with a writer for Business Insider and just chatted him up on Twitter. He, he loves Twitter. Um, and was like, yeah, let me send you some cases. And he was like, sure, yeah. And so, you know, we just sent him product. And then the next thing you know, our case is on the front page of Business Insider. <laughs> and, you know, our website blows up with referral traffic and just like orders start coming in like crazy. Not to mention it's like a, a great link back. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know like people are thinking, well, in my business, what do I spend the most time and energy doing? And mm -hmm. are there any other... Um, methods that you found have, have really worked uh, for your business? Yeah, well, AdWords has been great. Um, definitely, we've uh, since like passed it on to a friend of ours who runs our account now, but uh, know what you're doing for sure because you can eat up a lot of dollars there. And uh, just kind of try and figure out where your customers are. Um, but yeah, like touching base with bloggers and things like that is like a really easy thing to do. And you know, who doesn't like getting free product? Right, right. So, Sky, what are some of the big lessons you've learned so far? Definitely, um, dealing with China is is really hard. Um, the time zone issues are tough. Um, my partner John, he's the one who's usually chatting with them. So he's their day starts at six p.m. So he's you know chatting with them from six p.m. to midnight some nights. Um, and the thing with China is that. You never really know what you're going to get. Um, they can send you good samples, good product one time. The next batch you get, there could be something different about it. Mm -hmm. um, it might be good. It might be bad. You know, we've had shipments go completely wrong, and the recourse on that is really tough. Yeah. Tell me about that. What was one of those tough, tough uh, situations? So yeah, we we released our uh, Woody case, which is a, a full wood iPhone case. I, that was last February. Um, that was one of the ones that got featured on Business Insider. And we sold out our first batch immediately, which was awesome. And we had back orders coming in. Um, we also knew that it was a little bit fragile and that if you dropped it, it would probably break. Just when you get wood that thin, it's really hard to keep it strong still. But we had all these orders coming in for people that wanted it. And so it was a really tough decision um, to actually order more stock. And we did. Um, and so it came in, we got the orders out, and then complaints started coming in of cases being broken. And so then we're replacing cases. And then it turned out that something in this batch, either in the factory or at our warehouse, the wood actually started to warp. And it actually didn't fit your phone. If you put it on, it would break. And so we ended up with just a ton of stock that we couldn't use. Wow. And trying to get um, any kind of recourse from people in China is, is really, really hard. So what do you do? You deal with it and kind of, you know, burn cut glasses and Do you burn the wood in the fireplace? What do you do with it? <laughs> Yeah, we actually just got a bunch of them back from our warehouse, so we're not really sure what to do with them yet, but we'll definitely have something fun with it. So how did you modify it? Because you still have the you know the woody case. How did you modify it so it was stronger? Yeah, so we still have some for iPhone 4 up there, which was good. It was like it was the dark the dark one was the dark walnut 
had some issues with it. And so that's sort of what pushed us into making uh, the Woody Hybrid, which is basically the blend. That's what with, you just uh, showed. That's what I just showed, which is that blend between the plastic shell and the wood backing. And so that gives it a lot more durability. It makes it lighter. It makes it slimmer. Um, it just, most people, you know, you're going to see the back of the phone the most. So that's like really where you want that design to be. Um, and it was cheaper. Um, so there's just a lot of bonuses to it. Um, so we've had way, way less complaints about it. And it's just a better product we found all around. So every time we've kind of taken a case, figuring out what the customers are saying about it, and then the next time we have to do a stock run, figure out how we can iterate on it and make it better. So was that the first iteration after it was breaking? Was it the hybrid or was it there was something else in between? Yeah, that was the hybrid. It was. Yeah, it took us probably four months to get it done. So what is that process? What do you do in that four months? Um, start looking at alternatives, discuss with, well, we dropped the one supplier that we got those cases from, started looking at some other people that supplied uh, different wood products. Um, then you just kind of get samples in, see what looks good, see what doesn't, um, get another batch of samples and another batch of samples. And, you know, you're slowly refining that every time. And uh, just with uh, the delays with dealing in China, you know, the timelines definitely drag out easily. Right. Yeah. So, and, and you, for that supplier, because I know you visited China several times, was that one of the ones you actually met or, or did this come later when you visited? Our, uh, our supplier of the original Woody, we didn't meet. Um, but uh, yeah, we went to Hong Kong and China in October. We went to uh, the electronic uh, trade show um, in Hong Kong, which was amazing. And then uh, went over into Shenzhen where we met up with our supplier and he took us to some of the factories and we went to some of the factory malls there, or uh, sorry, supplier malls, um, which is like just huge malls that you would see anywhere in North America, but it's just all suppliers representing different factories wow. and you can find just about anything you want. So what did you learn when you went over there? Basically that um, your product is free game. You know, we are every, we saw multiple booths that had knockoff Beats headphones, you know, for $8. And they might not even be knockoffs, they could be right off the production line. You know, we had, uh, you know, saw life proof cases. We saw, you know, all those different uh, external battery packs are popping up now. Those are everywhere. Yeah. Um, those Bluetooth speakers, the, uh, the Jawbone, um, those, you know, you can get for really cheap over there too. You know, as soon as some technology from the U.S. goes over to China, it, it'll get knocked it's up. everywhere. Yeah. Um, a really good book to read about uh, the Chinese uh, manufacturing and dealing with them is called uh, Poorly Made in China. And it just details one guy's account of 10 years being a, a middleman between U.S. companies and the suppliers in China. So knowing that, what do you do differently in your business? Because that's kind of scary to see. Yeah. Um, you just basically have to accept it. And, you know, if, if the big players, you know, can't stop it, right. what, what are you going to do? I mean, do you do anything different with marketing or advertising um, as far as that goes? Yeah, you, you basically have to be better at marketing. And that's, you know, where we try and push forward and we try and give the customer a better experience from the product to the shipping to the customer service. You know, that's where you really have to add value. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is a scary thing. What about mistakes that you made? Um, I know you talked about that first batch that was, that was fragile. What other things should people watch out for um, when, you know, I guess in your journey? Yeah, um, I think definitely for us early on is like finances and uh, try and really tracking where your money is going. Um, and that's still, still a challenge of us because none of us have a finance background. So it's been a big learning experience to really break it down and, you know, see where money is going. It's easy to, you know, we use a bunch of these different uh, startup services and those add up, you know, and you see just like money going in, money going out and not really sure where it relates to what. So what, what systems have you put in place now that helps you kind of manage that? Um, so we've got like a full backend on our website that tracks all the sales. 
it uh, tracks the shipping charges, um, it knows what our unit costs are, um, so we can get breakdowns out of that. Um, then we've got like a few other accounting programs that are tracking our finances that way. Um, and then we're just right now trying to put in a few more um, just weekly and monthly meetings just to review. Because that's the non-sexy stuff, but that's kind of the bottom line that makes a difference, especially if you're buying bulk cases and you know, that you're not just doing drop shipping. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, there's so many processes in it of just like the manufacturing costs, then you got to get it into the country. So you've got shipping, you've got duties, um, then it's going to be processed at your warehousing facility. They're going to add on their shipping and handling to that. So it's just kind of like a piece process which slowly gets subtracted from your retail price. Right. So let's say someone wants to follow in your path, not with cases, but some other product. They order a bunch of stuff from China and you know they, they see, okay, I like this, you know, whatever, these magnets. How did you find the, the person or like when you're making a trip to China, it's a big investment and trip. Do you just go to one of the trade shows or do you suggest someone get, get someone kind of that's a middleman in between? Yeah, definitely. Like once you're ready to start doing more bulk orders, um, just look on Alibaba. There's like manufacturers for just about everything there. And all those people use Skype. So they'll chat with you as long as you want to stay up to their hours, you know? Mm -hmm. So you got to really stay up late and just talk. And you really have to work through uh, the broken English and really break down to the base level of what exactly that you're looking for. Yeah. I want to talk about one thing with when you have multiple co founders, there can be, you know, static. Not everyone agrees all the time. What's been some of the challenges with, with having two other co-founders? Yeah, there's definitely, um, it's, we've been really working hard on our communication because we've never had an office until recently. Um, we've always been working from home or uh, some days, you know, we'll go to someone's house and kind of work there. But uh, for the most part, we're all remote. And so it's been a big challenge to just um, be open with everyone and just let people know what you're working on, um, what you're going to be responsible for, um, and just kind of that daily, weekly schedule of like what's going to get done. Um, and then any of the major decisions too, like with three people, um, if there's any kind of disagreement, you're going to end up you're going to end up with a two on one. Yeah. So <laughs> what's your what's your tiebreaker? How do you break the tie? Um, well, with three people, we. We don't have a time. I mean, do you have like majority rules or what's the system for? Oh, yeah. It's, it's usually majority. Majority rules. So that's like, it's good and then it's, it's bad too because then you get one person that's left out. Right. So, got it. So what, <laughs> um, I guess, what brought you to the decision to, to get a new office? Why not just keep working from home? Yeah, the thing with working from home, which um, is good, but it's also... It's tough, like most of us have small apartments in Vancouver and going over to someone's house and working on their couch or like none of us have a really good work environment for three people. And getting an office, you have this neutral space that anyone can go to at any time. You don't have to worry about, uh, is my laundry out? Is there dishes around? You know, wearing, is your place clean? Is, is your girlfriend around? all that kind of stuff. So we'd always have kind of this morning conversation of whose house are we going to go to? And that completely takes it out of the equation now. Um, so we can just kind of go when we want and we can now we can store stock there and different supplies. Um, so it's been great. Um, we, luckily we got like uh, a discount from one of our friends who is uh, subleasing to us. So that really got us in the door, um, but it's been great so far. How do you... Sky um, actually divide up the responsibilities because I noticed you know your title is CTO, someone else is CEO. How do you divide that up? Um, yeah, it, it's definitely been a challenge since day one of like figuring out who's responsible for what. Um, but uh, I take care of like a lot of the technical side stuff, um, some of our like pay per click and managing that, and uh, our Amazon sales channels and. Um, John looks after more of the operations side of uh, dealing with China, um, getting product in, 
Um, Jim's definitely more of our uh, creative, outgoing person who, you know, he's out and about talking with clients. Um, he's like doing some of our marketing. Um, so, but, you know, the one thing I've learned about getting into your own business is that, you know, everyone is going to have to do everything at some point. You know, you'll have some specializations, but um, it's all hands on deck whenever you need anything. So, everyone's going to be doing sales, everyone's going to be doing marketing. Um, that's like the biggest two things I've learned from, yeah, this is just like you need to have sales and marketing no matter what. I know we were talking too and you're saying Jim is more of the you know, creative mind of the three of you. Um, mm -hmm. I want to hear some of his, what are some of his good ideas that you've shut down in the past? <laughs> yeah, so we have, uh, we've got our Game Boy case and we've, he's definitely thrown it around a few times about making it into a real Game Boy where you could play Tetris on the back of your iPhone or, uh, you know, having that Nintendo controller. On the back it, of your iPhone? Like actually, yeah. oh. So, so the screen would actually work, the buttons would work, and you could play Tetris, you know? Hmm, interesting. Ha having a Nintendo controller that you could then like interface with, who knows, your Xbox or any of your consoles and use it as an actual controller. And so, you know, it's like really cool, fun ideas. And then we start, you know, thinking about what's involved to actually do that. We're just going, like, yeah, you know, it's probably not going to work right now. It's not really in our, our timeline. Yeah. So what about some of the other case options that you come up with? Because also you can come up with a million different case ideas, too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, just like different textures all the time of like, you know, using spandex or using like uh, golf ball material. Um, but yeah, we definitely... You know, the friends are, are the funniest ones who, because, you know, your friend always has a good right. idea for you of, like, what case should you do and, um, you know, cool wallets or something like that. Like, lots of the time we've already seen or heard about these cases before, but, yeah, like, friends are always kind of interjecting, you know, what they think the new, the new best thing is going to be. Right. So, I mean, you, pr you guys, you know, with friends, family, customers... What's your process for taking on someone's idea and actually seeing if you're going to do it? Um, the easiest way for us is just to uh, like get samples done because that upfront cost is usually fairly minimal um, that we can interface with China and get some really cool stuff made and get it shipped over cheap enough that you know if it, if it looks good in concept, we can make it fairly cheaply and then you know get a good idea of if it's going to actually resonate with people. Um, so then, you know, samples and then they go, we just put them on our phones, take them out, show them to people, see what they think and then go from there. How do you decide, because obviously you can't get samples made of all of them. How do you decide, do you just put it to a three person vote or what do you do? Yeah, it, it's, it usually comes down to some kind of vote and how, um, how easy it is to produce. Because depending on the complexity, if you need to start um, doing your own plastic molds, that's where the added cost comes into play. So if you've got a really custom case that where the factory is going to have to make a custom mold, then you're looking at you know what, maybe a five grand cost up front. Yeah. And the thing once again with China is once you go and pay the money to get a mold, they have free reign to use it. So you don't really know what's happening out the back door. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's been the most popular uh, cases that you sell? Um, our cassette case has definitely been the most popular one throughout, like, since we started. Um, and then recently, our uh, Woody Hybrid has uh, definitely pulled on strong. Like, it definitely resonates with a different uh, crowd. Um, and, yeah, like, most of us all rock that one for the most of the time. We just, we're going to be relaunching uh, a wool case in the next month. Um, and then we also have a court case that's coming out in the next month too. So part of our, uh, our drive this next year is just to get more products out. I just saw on Twitter, they were asking about, or I saw the picture of the court case. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. And, uh, yes. I actually put a comment about, um, well, what should we call it? And I was like, oh, you should call it. And you'd probably appreciate this because Sammy Sosa or like some baseball player <laughs> that uses corks. <laughs> but then I that's said, no, good. maybe that's it's, good. maybe it's Roy's not. Not cork in that case. So. <laughs> the corked bat. Right. Um, so with the branded cases, you also have something called Case Starter. Mm -hmm. What's that? So Case Starter is a platform that we put together 
um, so that any mainly towards people with big audiences um, so they can create their own case um, market it to their fan base and then we would provide the platform for sales um, all the production all the fulfillment um, and so that actually came from uh, one of the podcasts that I listened to on uh, Mixergy which was about Teespring which basically does the same thing with t-shirts okay. and I thought, it would, I thought it would translate over really well and so have people tried it out yet? Yep. Um, so actually it was one of our early customers. Uh, she runs a, a pretty high profile, well, not super high profile, but it was like a comic site. Um, and she's got a really dedicated following. And we reached out to her and talked to her about it. And she was like really stoked to get on board, um, had a design for us. And then we put up the sales page and she just pitched it out to her fans for an entire month. And uh, we got the minimum sales in place and, you know, got to produce this case for her. And she was just like so happy about it. It was, uh, it was a really fun process. So do they do that then? You create a dedicated page for that or do they go on one of these kind of crowdfunding sites? We create a dedicated page on our site, um, so that, which takes care of all the sales. And then once the campaign gets funded, we do all the manufacturing and the shipping and handling. Nice. I'll have to tell, uh, email the people from Teespring. I think they'll appreciate that yeah, you got that <laughs> idea from, from them. Um, and so what's been a low point? You know, obviously in the, in the front of the interview, I talked about how you guys started with $1,500. And, you know, most people who want to start something up part-time want to reach that, that first milestone for you. You reached mm -hmm. six figures working part-time. Obviously now you're full-time. But what's been a low point? I think the biggest low point was... Um, not getting renewed with Best Buy and that uh, really got us off the ground but definitely showed us what the swings were like um, and so we were pretty disappointed when that fell through. How does that work? You know like is it just they order a certain amount and then after that you have to renew or how does that? Yeah so um, what happened I guess the last year or so Best Buy's had a pretty big shake up with their company um, and our sales rep uh, got laid off. Um, we got assigned to a new account manager and she wanted Hello Kitty cases and a bunch of other kind of random products that were like, uh, what? <laughs> um, so we had products that as far as we knew were selling through their channels perfectly fine, but we just had a sales rep that didn't want to do business. Um, and so we didn't really have an avenue to push through that. So how do you navigate that? Do you, are you able to fulfill some of her requests or is it just these are what we have? We thought about it. Um, lots of the stuff that she wanted was trademark branded products like Disney products, like Marvel products that would take a lot of uh, effort and time to like go to Disney and ask right. for a partnership deal, you know? Yeah. And... Yeah, that's that's tough. So then, what do you do? You just, you just kind of find other avenues. Yeah, we we just had to move on and like try different other fulfillment and distribution channels. Um, we really pushed hard on our web, and that you know picked up a lot of the slack when that didn't come through. Uh, we pushed into Amazon, which has done really well for us. Um, so we're just sad to like find other ways to make it work. Yeah, from a business perspective, that's that's a low point. What about personally? Um, were there any personal low points for, for you and the co-founders or relationship wise where things had to be patched up? Yeah, we've definitely, we have our, uh, arguments and disagreements for sure. Um, cause at this point so, you probably, you guys are probably like brothers. Yeah. Yeah. So, and with that, you know, brothers fight. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we definitely get into the odd argument. Um, and I think the biggest thing to overcome that is just communication. I think anytime a lot of the arguments seem to come from email and text message. So, but as soon as you get someone in person or on the phone, you know, you actually figure out what their context was. Um, so I'd stress like, you know, talk to the person outright directly and don't try and just like send one off little comments through email or text or anything like that because then it, it escalates so quickly that then you kind of forget what you're arguing about originally. Right, right. Now, going from that, what's been 
a proud accomplishment, something that you're amazed that you were able to do? I was really amazed to um, quit my job last June. So that's when I came on full time. And, you know, doing that, I think, like, was the next big step. And pushing out that and really, you know, embracing that entrepreneurship and saying, like, yeah, I can do this um, was a, just a huge step for me. Did you have a certain figure in mind that you wanted the company to reach before you quit? At what point did you say, I'm quitting my job? It, it wasn't a money figure. It was, it was definitely more of a lifestyle figure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like my other job got to the point where I just, you know, I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't being challenged. Um, you know, the company wasn't going in the direction that I wanted it to. And I thought, you know, this was time, it's time to get out. Um, and then, you know, I can put all my energies into rocket cases and push it forward. So what's the best part about now working on it full time? You get to make your own schedule. Um, you get the flexibility to work from anywhere. I was just in Mexico for two weeks on a little workcation with some other entrepreneur buddies. And, you know, you uh, eat, sleep, surf, and work. And, you know, I, that was a big test for me to see how much I could get done working from a different location. And, yeah, yeah I got a ton of work done there. And it was amazing. So, you know, now I just want to look forward to pushing into other places to go and hang out and especially in uh, Vancouver in the winter can be really dark if anybody knows the Pacific Northwest Um, so getting to Mexico and getting some vitamin D was great yes so who are some of your mentors and what advice did they give you throughout Um, one of the guys I I look up to a lot is uh, is Noah Kagan at AppSumo and I just love how easily he takes action on things and I think for for a long time definitely a couple of years you know I knew I wanted to do something but I just didn't have that extra step to really take action you know you you think about it for so long and you see people doing other things and you question yourself but uh, until you take the first step you know it's you're not really getting anything done um, and it doesn't really matter what it is just like get started I think you know that's like a huge takeaway and break it down to like the smallest actionable steps possible. You know, you can have this really grand idea, but a lot of people don't ask the right questions to know where to start. Yeah, and you seem like an avid reader too. Any books that you recommend that are must reads for people? Uh, yeah, I've just like, one of my big personal goals is to read more. Um, and so like I've set a goal for reading three books a month. And uh, I just finished uh, Pitch Anything, which is really good um, just for sales and, uh, you know, learning the different kind of aspects of talking with people. Um, and then I just went through uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, um, which is an amazing for just structuring out your business, figuring out what to focus on, um, and just like putting your business into the right focus for your priorities. Yeah. Um, yeah, like Ultimate Sales Machine, that's really good too. Um, then some of the other more of like spiritual ones, like uh, Letters from a Stoic, just the more philosophy side. Um, yeah, I can probably. Yeah, I remember much. someone someone I interviewed mentioned they like plan. They had their whole something like daily routine planned around mastering the Rockefeller habits. <laughs> I think it was Jordan from Molding Box, but I can't remember for sure. Um, so what about Sky, some of the uh, companies, products, or software that's essential for your business that you use that people should be using. Yeah, we use uh, we use Desk for all our support. Desk dot com. Mm-hmm. I think that's owned by Salesforce now, mm-hmm. um, and we just have uh, we've got their free account still, which is just amazing. Um, I didn't even know they had a free account. They might not actually not have it anymore. It might be grandfathered, mm-hmm. but um, then uh, let's see. We use Grasshopper for all our phone stuff. So we've got our virtual phone set up. I was wondering, I'm like, wow, this guy, because you sent the phone through, it's like an 866 number. I'm like. (laughs) Yeah, we're big time, right? Yeah, you're big time, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Then let's see, like, we use Webgistics for all our fulfillment, and they've been great so far. Um, Asana for all of our uh, task management, 
task assignment, you know, staying on track. They're amazing too. I don't know how their product is still free. Um, you know, Google apps for our email and our docs, um, you know, AdWords for our pay-per-click. PayPal does all our transaction management. Uh, we use MailChimp for all of our mail outs. Um, Dropbox to host a lot of our media files. You know, there's just like so many different awesome services and products out there that are so integral to like today's online business. Yeah. So I want you, I have one last question for you, Scott. I appreciate your time because, um, you know, this journey, I know like three people off the top of my head that, you know, will will zero in and, and just watch this 100% and probably rewatch it because um, they're wanting to do <laughs> stuff in China and things like that. But um, tell me what's, you know, tell people a little bit about Rocket Cases, what's exciting now and where they can go to find out more. Um, so, yeah, if you want to find out more about Rocket Cases, you can just go to rocketcases.com. Um, we've got a big push for this next year just to get out more products. And, you know, we've got this amazing looking wool fabric case. Uh, we've got this court case coming out in the next month. We've got three or four other cases on the horizon coming up. Um, you know, just pushing forward. We're really pushing our, uh, you know, our custom branded channel too. Um, and so like really giving some businesses some really cool cases that they can show off to either like they can give away at trade shows, they can give to their fans. Um, you know, just there's a lot of avenues that are opening up now that we're just finally getting the focus and the resources to actually push into. Yeah, yeah. So Rocket Cases, and obviously they can find it on Amazon.com, and we figured yep. out you can also find it on the Best Buy website still. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And so my last question is this. What do you see with, you know, I don't usually ask questions like this, but for you, I, I don't know, I felt the need to, which is what do you see three years out or five years out, you know, for, for rocket cases? Because it's such a very cool, you know, when you go on, it's just visually, everything's kind of visually appealing. And, you know, everyone, you just check out rocketcases.com to see kind of the layout of the site. And it's just, it kind of just pops. Yeah. Three to five years, um, definitely pushing forward into like the accessory market more. Um, definitely looked at um, other things than uh, phone cases, but um, yeah, just like pushing forward into that space more, making our presence known, um, really building up our profile, getting into more of these distribution channels so that you know we can get in front of the public, um, and then just starting to um, you know take more some of that rewards that comes from running your own business of like being able to take some team trips, uh, things like that. But, you know, getting to China is a huge bonus. Yeah. I think I asked that because what, what strikes me too is that you guys have stayed so focused. you like, if it were me, I'd probably be like, what's another accessory? What's this or what's that? You guys have really stuck, it seems to iPhone cases. Is that something yeah. you do consciously? Or is that hard to do? How do you stay so focused? It's it's definitely tough. We've uh, we looked at Samsung for sure. Um, we were really close to uh, pulling the trigger and releasing it, but you know, it's the thing with um, Android related products is that you just have so many different handsets, and you know, as soon as you come out and start to support one, there's like I don't know how many others. There's 10, 20 different ones, and all of a sudden, you know. Your, uh, uh, your inventory has gone tenfold. And then, you know, you don't have as much traction in each one because there's so much more niche. You know, you have the Galaxy, which is huge. That was the one we were close to supporting. But just, you know, you can have one size for the iPhone 4, one size for the iPhone 5. It covers four different phone models and probably has the bulk share of, like, the phones out there. Yeah, yeah, no. Scott, I just want to be the first one to thank you so much. Reach out, check out Rocket Cases, and um, I really appreciate your time with this guy. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I really enjoyed it.